Hey folks, welcome to The Michael Rollins Show. And today's guest is none other than Justin Skinner. Now here's a question for you. Do any of you know what my first frame was? It was in fact a neato frame. And did you know that Justin Skinner was one of the co-founders of Neato Frames? Sadly, Neato Frames is no longer with us. Even though they made beautiful frames, you can listen to Justin to hear about why Neato Frames is no longer in operation. I'd like to take this opportunity to tell you about my Patreon. My Patreon is something that I've been working on that is gonna support future endeavors to make this show better. There's a $3 tier on my Patreon that allows you to get early access and full access to an MP3 audio podcast of everything that you're going to hear today. But it's not just this episode, it's all the episodes that Justin and I filmed together. And not only that, there's extra content in those MP3s that is not going to appear on YouTube. I hope that you will consider becoming a patron and support me in making this show. The link to Justin, as well as my Patreon, is in the description below, and I hope that you guys enjoy it. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Are you ready? All right. Let's go. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, I bring to you the one, the only, the bearded wonder himself, Justin Skinner, also known as It Will Be Fun FPV. Thank you, Justin, for coming on the Michael Rollins show. Thank you for having me, Michael Rollins. So for those of our audience who are not familiar with your past or my past, um, I actually have a very special place in my heart for you. It's not because we have a love child together. Uh, it, is. It, is because oh, wow. of, it is because of this box back here, which I'm gonna get. I'll see that beauty. So oh, this is, is Hey. This is my first drone. Look at that. This is this is the Neato Frame Sexy Little Beast. I think this was V1. The and first one, right? Number 1. Yeah. This was yeah, yeah, yeah. this was uh, this I don't know if it was the number that, like, 1 off the, the head? Uh this did hit me in the head. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So hold on, let me put it back. Um The Sexy Little Beast. That's what started it all. That was man. I uh, that was the first the first drone I ever I ever the first m mini quad that I ever owned, and I remember you guys had this build list, and you had the 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 drones them so the frames themselves, and man, I followed your build list to a T. Yeah, including the twenty eight hundred kV motors. Yeah, that was a little much. <laughs> that was a little much. I didn't know any better back then. You were building what I was flying, and I didn't know any better at the time. So here I am. I have absolute, uh, almost <laughs> zero idea how to fly FPV, and somebody straps a rocket ship to. It was only four inches. It was, it was four inches. Yes, it squad. was four inches at twenty eight hundred kV. <laughs> well, was it that fun? Oh my God! It was so much fun. I remember, I remember when I eventually, and we can get into this later. But eventually, I had to move on to a different frame, and I think I, I went on to the uh, the one that's over there. I don't think you can see it. And I remember going to um, Red Bottom twenty three hundred KVs five inch, thinking, yeah. okay, this is this should be this should be really fun now. And I the first flight I had, I was like, damn, this thing's slow. <laughs> Yeah, that KV, it really was a big difference maker. Yeah, it really was. So, for those of, for those of us, for those in the crowd that don't know, um, why don't you tell me a little bit about your intro into FPV how, and, and where it led you? Uh, like origin? Yeah, like origin. What's your origin story? Oh, uh, well, the brother-in-law, it was my 20, shoot, what is this, 2015. So it was my 26th birthday, and my brother-in-law pulled out his phone and was showing this, me this video of some people flying these little these little Nano QX FPVs uh, drones in a warehouse, and they were racing around. And uh, well, that was the first year I bought myself a present 
for my birthday. And I just bought a Nano QX 3D and uh, about a month later I was 100% hooked. Like there was one day I was out flying in a field and I just remember thinking, uh, I, was in a, I was circling myself, I was what we call orbiting now. I was orbiting, orbiting myself and just like following myself around. And uh, you know, when, you, when, when a guy gets excited, you know, really excited, he gets a little, little, little half chub thing going on. And uh, that was kind of what I knew. <laughs> that was kind of what I knew. I was like, wow, this is it. This is, uh, mm -hmm. this is what I want to do. And so I started, you know, researching the next steps, and uh, that's when I kind of found, uh, what was it, um, Charpu? No, was it mm -hmm. the that concrete explosion of a building? One of those first videos that he had, uh, mm -hmm. really big, and started following like links and stuff until I figured out the five-inch stuff or the four-inch stuff, I guess, and jumped right in right away. Actually, I didn't. Uh, I hired my future partner. Uh, Nick Zuhowski to build my first drone because I just wanted to jump straight in the fly. I didn't want to have to worry about learning to build. I figured I'd just learn to build as I broke stuff, which was all the time. So yeah, learned quick. Yeah, I, I I think my my death toll may have been higher than yours. I think I, uh, I I I sent back a few frames to you that were just brutalized, including that one. Ah. I still have a box full of just broken needle frames, man. It's it's Do you really? plus frames. Yeah. Oh, then I don't. I can't bad. touch you. No, it's pretty bad. It was yeah. a lot of prototyping though. So, yeah. and uh, I had the whole theory of you know I can't learn unless I break. So mm -hmm. I never held back early on. Um, I still don't really hold back, but I did. I really didn't hold back early on. Like it was just trees. We didn't have any soft objects to to practice around. I I had trees in a backyard, and if I was going straight at it. And I knew I should be dodging. I wouldn't dodge for some reason. I would just go head on right into it and just break everything. <laughs> and that's before the, that was before replaceable arms too. So I was snapping yeah. arm and have to replace the bottom plate right away. But luckily, I had a, a frame company, so I had a bunch of them. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about that frame company. So it was Neato Frames. Yeah. And tell me, tell me a little bit about that. Uh, well, like I said, I hired Nick. To because you'd seen him around I me, mean, everyone at that point had seen him um, in either the Facebook group, some of the mini quad groups, somewhere you had seen his build because he was building the prettiest quads around, and they weren't his. They were they were he was building them for customers, and uh, so when I reached out to him and asked him if he could build mine, I found out he lived in Dallas, and it was just up the road for me, and so I went and met him for lunch one day, and uh, oh no, actually I hired him before we even met. I hired him. Um, to build them and he built it and we met for lunch and we started talking and he was telling about all of his modeling skills and um, I had spent the previous like five years you know starting and, and building small businesses and so I saw kind of a, a unique opportunity to partner up with him to try to um, you know create our own frames really at the time uh, I really just wanted to fund this hobby because it was expensive even you know back then it was probably more expensive back then. I think prices may have dropped. Mm -hmm. I think it was like three, four hundred dollars to build build something back then. Frames were selling for a hundred bucks or more. Um, yeah. Racing frames, and now we sell them for what forty five dollars. Mm -hmm. So uh, hired him or not hired him, but uh, talked him into it. You know, he, he thought about it for a minute, but he ended up coming around and started designing. I think he knocked out that uh, that sexy little beast, the one eighty, in like a night. And sent me, you know, you know, renders of it, and we tweaked it a little bit. But then we got the first version cut like right away, and met up again, and decided to move forward with it because we were meeting up at uh, Sweet Tomatoes, this little buffet salad place, and yeah, we just decided to jump right in and start having fun. That's kind of what happened. Real easy, nothing big, um, just to kind of see where it went. Now your frames at the time were pretty were pretty unique though. Because yeah. you you guys you guys put an element into design that I think was missing from a lot of other frame companies. Yeah, the the whole concept behind uh, needle frame. I'm trying to find out. I used to have a bunch of them laying around, but all I have now is this one up here, the fast bag. Nah, I'll show you later. Okay. Um, the whole the whole point of them was to be different than the box frames that we were seeing around. Every frame you saw was just a flying bus. It was just a rectangle with arms. Um, some different cutouts basically and you know we started talking about what what made something sexy and he was really into cars he still really is you've seen his Lotus 
He's got a yeah. bad. He's got. He's got. He's on a second Lotus now, and um, it was. It's to do with curves, really. You know, the curves, the angles that come you know, on cars were sexy. And you think about women. You like women with curves, and and uh, so that was the whole thing. It had to have curves. It just that was all we were trying to aim for at the beginning. Was yeah, just had to have curves. Yep. That's all it was. And if you look at the top plate, the top plate really um, mm-hmm. emphasized it. And then oh, the the skirts, of course were the yeah. big difference maker. No one else had really anything going on with skirts at the time. Um, you know, it was functional to protect the electronics, but it was also, you know, he with his background in modeling, because he was working on movies at the time, uh, doing 3D, 3D models for actual animations and, and movies. Um, now he's doing, uh, I can't remember the company's name, but he's doing uh, architectural stuff now. Mm-hmm. But he just he's an extremely skilled designer and most of the people designing frames at the time were amateurs. They were just picking up CAD software and throwing out their ideas. Which is great for a hobby, you know, it's a it's a do it yourself hobby, figure it out yourself. But to bring in bring in that quality, that caliber of a designer, you know, really kind of gave us an edge as far as looks are concerned. Because most people are using like like two D renders and he's using polymorphic renders. I'm not even sure I've said mm-hmm. that right. He's using like really advanced techniques that creates curves and, and and you can just see the subtle curves to it. If you hold your skirt, if you still had it, you hold your skirt up and just hold it to the light, you can see the subtle curves he has embedded into it. And it's all purposeful um, and, and from his mind. And he knocks them out like so quickly too, where it would take, mm-hmm. you know, uh, even an experienced designer, it would take them probably a week. It takes him a night because he just obsesses and focuses and, and just he doesn't do anything else but think about it. So... It was really fun working with him and coming out with these different designs and seeing what he could create. I think the the one frame that y'all produced and it was limited run was the V-tail. That was the yeah. one. God, that thing was gorgeous. <laughs> the uh, Widowmaker. <laughs> the Widowmaker. That's what it was. Yeah. The Widowmaker. Y'all had the best names too, man. It was. Uh, <laughs> it was like the <laughs> sexy little beast and the Widowmaker and the fastback. Alan, the fastback. Breakneck, yeah. We had fun with the names. We would we would code name code name them, and we would just keep throwing out random names we thought of throughout the day, looking at mm-hmm. it until we decided on one. The Widowmaker, I think, ended up becoming uh, that because you'd have you become a widow or no? What was it? It'd make you you you'd make your wife a widow flying that thing. Yeah, flying the thing. <laughs> I guess she she'd kill you because you're spending money on a, a V tail instead of a quad. Right. That's what it was. That's what I'm yeah, that was that was that particular one. I, I I remember you guys did that run of frames because it was a special edition and you didn't do many of them. I don't think. And mm-hmm. I think I, it was like twenty five. Yeah, and I I, I I I actually had it ordered. I had the, the the page ready, and I never clicked the button. I think that's one of the one of the non purchases that I regret the most because that would that would be a beautiful wall queen right there. There are there's still some people that are collecting them as exactly that wall queens. Like you have your shadow box. I think we sent you that shadow box. You did send me that shadow box. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't remember why. Um, so I, I, God, what was the story behind that one? I had run it. I was I was doing what you did, where instead of ducking and dodging and weaving, I was just, <clears throat> and um, <laughs> I think with that crash, I hit the tree so hard that it crumpled the top plate and broke uh, the standoffs. And then it um, uh, also broke one of the arms. And uh, at the same time, ejected the memory card from my, I was flying a, um, a Yi camera. You remember the Yees? Yeah, yeah. The yeah, Yee. so I had a Yi cam, Yi action cam. And um, was that a Xiaomi Yi? Um, sure. I don't remember. Anyways, it, it, it hit so hard that it ejected the memory card from the camera, and the camera never worked again. And uh, I, I, I sent you guys a picture and said, do you guys want this back um, so you can study how it failed? Oh, right, yeah. And so I shipped it to you, and then you guys, I think you, y'all, y'all had it for like, a year, I think it was quite a long time because you you it, shipped me the. You... We got Go that 
we we, were, we decided I don't remember why we decided to get you the shadow box, but we got the shadow box, and then I just took forever to mount it. I literally just took forever to mount it. It sat right. in the shadow box like on my shelf for that entire time. So I was cleaning it up one day. I was like, okay, I got to do this. Yeah. And, um, which was fine. I mean, it was, it was a joy to get it back. Um, and it's, and it's something that like, you know, you really can't see it because of the lights and everything, but like whenever I walk in, I know what that is. So it's cool that you have it. I love that you still yeah. have it. Yeah. It was, it was, it, it, it has, a, it has a special place in my heart here. Um, but with all that said, uh, Nito's not around anymore. No. No, Nick's Nick's uh, focused on you know his real work, you know the actual money making work, and uh, mm -hmm. I moved on. I partnered up with, or I, I'm I'm working with uh, Flight Club, and mm -hmm. running the Neutron and Proton R. So, mm -hmm. yeah, we just did just uh, as I told you, you know, pre-interview, we had the the warranty, the lifetime warranty was one of the other ways we were trying to differentiate differentiate ourselves. We weren't really, it was never about making a whole lot of money. Uh, it was always about just funding our, you know, our passions, our hobby, mm -hmm. our testing. Really, it was always each frame that we launched basically funded the next frame, uh, designing and prototyping the parts for it. Um, kept me in the air because I mean, if you watch my earlier videos, I just crashed all the time. So it kept me in the air and allowed me to keep flying. But uh, the, that warranty just kind of ate us up after a couple years of our, our customers coming back for more frames and more frames. Um, the warranties actually caught up with sales to the point where the bank account was, you know, dwindling down because of warranty costs instead of, you know, just not normal day-to-day -day costs. And uh, when we when we shut down Nito 1.0, we were in the middle of working on a new frame, um, but we were going to relaunch the new frame with a Nito 2.0, a restructured, you know, cheaper mm -hmm. frames but no warranty. Um, we were going to be really competitive and that frame, that frame was a year of prototyping and testing and, but, you know, due to health, health issues and actual life issues uh, on my side and, and health issues on Nick's side, we just never followed through. We kind of just let it go and moved on, mm -hmm. decided it wasn't really worth the trouble anymore. Um, it's sad. It's definitely bittersweet for sure to, to yeah, move I on. I, I think, and the reason I bring it up is I think that there's this uh, belief in the, you know, in a, in a lot of the pilot community, and I think it's fading to a degree, um, but it it's that, you know, oh my God, you're selling a frame for a hundred dollars. Like you guys are greedy SOBs right. and that's far from the truth. Yeah. Well, I mean, I see their point of view. Um, they don't know what's going on behind it. They don't know what the sales are like. Um, you know, cause at the time when we were selling them for a hundred dollars, we were at like a hundred, 109 for our mm -hmm. four inch, a hundred, and then, uh, $110 for our five inch. There was no other frames really less than that, except for some super cheap carbon frames that people were buying. And, mm -hmm. uh, we always bought the, the highest grade carbon we could find. And we bought titanium, you know, which was more expensive and, um, and, and then also we weren't selling, you know, people have, you know, people think that you're, cause you have a frame company or whatever, and they see you all over. We were really good at getting our customers promotes through social media. So maybe it seemed like we were selling more than we actually were, but we only ever sold, we only have had about probably two to 300 core customers that bought every frame that we had. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we get, we get new customers in, but we had a core group of customers that would buy every frame, but because of the warranty they didn't buy multiples of the frame. They would just bash that one until they broke it and they'd claim a warranty, and which was fine by us. Um, uh, we, we priced it accordingly at the time. Uh, but like I said, it just over a couple of years of those customers bashing those frames nonstop and not buying new ones, uh, it just caught up to us. Neato Frames holds a real special place in my heart. They not only produced my first frame, but I became good friends with Justin through Neato Frames, and I value that friendship. One of the things I've always admired about Justin is that he is a social media genius. The guy has got Instagram on lock, and we talk a lot about that in our next episode. I hope that you'll join us for that. Talk to you soon. Bye.